chez les Godovens, Altesse royale, chers orateurs, chers amis. Bienvenue au symposium organisé par le Bridge Forum Dialogue en partenariat avec l'Université du Luxembourg. Au nom de l'Université de Luxembourg, je peux dire aussi que nous sommes très fiers de notre association euh, avec euh, le Bridge Forum Dialogue, euh, notre partenariat avec euh, ce forum de discussion et d'échange qui rassemble les, les organisations européennes et les institutions européennes au sein de ce pays qui est tellement inclusif. L'Université fête cette année ses 20 ans. Je suis très heureuse de saluer aussi Madame Erna Eneko Schorpchez, qui a vraiment travaillé pour la fondation de cette université. Et notre université se situe déjà dans le champ de la recherche scientifique internationalement reconnue, tout autant que milieu de la communauté nationale et internationale, si importante au Luxembourg. Et c'est un grand privilège pour nous de pouvoir nous associer au Bridge Forum, contribuer au Bridge Forum et aussi contribuer au développement de ces dialogues, de ces débats et de, de ces réflexions qui sont si importantes euh, maintenant euh, dans, dans le monde dans lequel nous vivons et bien sûr pour l'avenir. Parce qu'une université, c'est aussi quelque chose qui, qui travaille pour l'avenir, pour l'avenir de la connaissance euh, et aussi pour le monde du travail, notamment au Luxembourg. Je vais passer la parole à ma collègue. Elena Danescu, et je vous souhaite à tous et à toutes une excellente discussion et une belle soirée. Merci. Royal Highnesses, distinguished invited speakers, dear partners, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Europe Direct at the University of Luxembourg, a public history project co-financed by a European Union Competitive Funding and the Bridge Forum Dialogue, also together with their partners, the Luxembourg Center for Contemporary and Digital History, l'Institut Pierre Werner, la Robert Riffin International, European Stability Mechanism, the French Embassy, and la Banque Centrale du Luxembourg, I'm pleased to welcome you to this event, which will reflect uh, on economic and monetary union from a threefold perspective, looking at those who created economic and monetary union through their innovative ideas and visionary spirit, and by daring to believe in a Europe through currency, such as Pierre Werner, and Robert Triffin, as well as the country of Luxembourg. Secondly, those who are shaping EMU today and seeking consolidation and long-term sustainability. Our guest speakers, Jacques de la Rosière, Pierre Gramenia, epitomize this approach, as does Yves Merch, the funding president of the Bridge Forum Dialogue, who, are, um, who we are honored to have here with us this evening. Third, those who analyze IMO, narrate it, and glean lessons from the past as building blocks for the future, historian, researchers, and experts from academia, including professors Ivo Maas and Bernard Snois, as well as Dr. Ilaria Pazotti. As we had into October, we might look back at the 8 of October 1970 in Luxembourg, when Pierre Werner officially presented the plan by stages for an economic and monetary union in the European community. The Werner report set out the broad lines, principles and stages of IMU based on irreversibility and perfect symmetry between the economic and monetary aspects with political union as the ultimate objective. It also envisaged the involvement of the social partners, employers and unions in defining economic and monetary policy since the social dimension was seen as an intrinsic part of IMO. The Werner Report led to the creation of the European Monetary Cooperation Fund here in Luxembourg in 1973, the embryo of the future European Central Bank. 
This institutional architecture was inspired by Robert Triffin's early reflections on the European Reserve Fund in 1948, subsequently developed through his discussions with Jean Monnet and Pierre Verna. The three were committed to the European ideal and shared the same vision of an EMU rooted in perfect parallelism, democratic strength, and the social dimension. In 1989, Delors' report finally brought the Werner report to fruition, adopting the same philosophy and architecture, and Werner's vision on EMU was embedded in the Maastricht Treaty in 1992. The euro, the culmination of the Werner and Delors plans, has become much more than an economic and monetary instrument. It is now a symbol of European identity. And the euro bears an unmistakable Luxembourgish hallmark. It was a Luxembourger, Pierre Werner, who is the founding father of the euro. It was another Luxembourger, Jacques Santer, the president of that time of the European Commission, 1995-1999, who oversaw the advent of the single currency. Another Luxembourger, Jean-Claude Juncker, was the first permanent president of the Eurogroup and then president of the European Commission, and he steered monetary Europe through a period of profound crisis. And it is another Luxembourger, Pierre Gramenia, managing director of the European Stability Mechanism, based in Luxembourg, who has the task of looking ahead and reflecting on the future of economic and monetary union. Ladies and gentlemen, our program uh, is very rich today. We are going to look into insights and prospects of IMO. The first word uh, will be the word of two authors, Ivo Math and Ilaria Pazotti, who wrote a book on Robert Triffin, book which is the prize of a European History uh, Association. Then, through two keynote speeches, uh, we will have the dialogue between Jacques de la Rosière and Pierre Garmenia. Mr. de la Rosière will speak about IMO, myth or reality. Mr. Garmenia will speak about the journey to the euro and the resilient euro area. And at the end, Professor Bernard Snois will moderate a Q&A se session with the audience and a debate with you, the public. And Professor Bernard Snoir will also pronounce the concluding remarks. At the end of the conference, all the participants are kindly invited to a cocktail offered by Bridge Forum Dialogue in the cloister of Institut Pierre Werner, Cloister Lucien Vercollier. Now I would like to invite to take the floor Professor Ivo Maas to present the book Robert Triffin, Alive. Professor Maas, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, it's a very great uh, pleasure and a very great honor to be invited to present uh, the book uh, co-authored with Villaria Pozzotti on Robert Triffin, Alive. And uh, especially here in Luxembourg. Because Robert Triffin, he felt very much at home here in Luxembourg. He had many friends, uh, as Elena Danesco has already said, he was very close to Pierre Werner. But not only to Pierre Werner, also to many other people. And uh, he even made a modest contribution to the development of Luxembourg as a financial center. Um, now, Robert Triffin, um, he is very much known. I was born 1911, uh, passed away 1993. So he's a child of the interwar period. He's very much known because predicting the end of Bretton Woods, the implosion of the Bretton Woods system. Um, what is less well known, what we have more developed in the book is the, the, the personal aspect. He, he, it was also a moral indignation that 
the United States, the richest country in the world, was financing its deficit by the poorer countries, and that to finance the war in Vietnam, which he was, as a profound pacifist, very much against. Um, and so what, what were as driven, that's the analysis, but then he goes towards policy proposals. How can we improve the world? And then his, his first, his plan A was, well, we need a reform of the international monetary system. We need an international currency, very much the ideas of John Maynard Keynes. But he was a realist. This was not working. And so we said we need a plan B, and his plan B was regional monetary integration. Um, so Triffany was a child of the interwar period, the Great Depression, the market economy is not functioning, and so you need government intervention. And, and so uh, he, wa he wanted to study economics because he wanted to create a better world, a more prosperous world, a more peaceful world. And, and that's why he, he wanted to study economics. And, and so um, he was the son of a butcher, uh, and, and then he went to the University of Louvain, uh, studied economics, and his professors, well, two of his most famous professors were Albert Edouard Janssen and Paul van Zeeland. And they were not only, they were very erudite professors, knowing economic theory, but they were also active at the Belgian Central Bank, they became prime minister, finance minister, so they were involved in policy. So they combined economic monetary theory with policy relevance. And, um, and what was one of the main themes which they were developing, well, the monetary system, it's evolving. They put the emphasis on the dynamics of the monetary system, evolving from being based on gold towards fiduciary money. And, and then we are at Triffin. What did Triffin want to do for the international monetary system? Away from gold and going towards fiduciary money. Other very important professor in Louvain was Duprier. Duprier was a specialist of business cycle policy and the business cycle. And so empirical analysis, looking at the data, looking at the dynamics of the economy. Uh, and so that was what, something which Triffin would also take on. Then Triffin, brilliant student, he gets a fellowship, uh, is uh, admitted to Harvard, uh, and there, completely different world. Completely different world, we have Schumpeter, Leontiev, um, Chamberlain, and so he, he goes into pure economic theory. His PhD, monopolistic competition theory and general equilibrium theory. So completely theoretical, nothing to do with anything practical. And this, afterwards, he will very quickly move again into practical monetary uh, issues. But the PhD is important because it would shape his perception. General equilibrium theory. If one country has a deficit, well, there must be another country which has a surplus. Imperfect competition theory, the market is power. There are power relations in the market. So it's very important to, for his uh, perception of economic phenomena. So Triffin, he gets a PhD from Harvard, goes back to, to Belgium. Duprier says, well, this PhD of Harvard, uh, this is not really a real PhD. You should do a real PhD here in Louvain. Uh, Triffin uh, is not really happy with that. He is offered an assistant professorship in Harvard. After one year, he goes back to, to Harvard. On the ship, he gets to know an American lady. After six hours of conversation, he proposed to marry her. She said, not so quickly. Um, and, and so he, he settles in the United States. The war starts. He becomes uh, an American citizen. And like all the other professors in Harvard, the other big universities, well, they go to Washington during the war. How can we help uh, improve the war effort of the Allies, and, and Triffin, he goes to the Federal Reserve Board, and he becomes there responsible for the Latin American desk. And so we'll have different visions to uh, missions to Latin America. And, um, and then he says, but the economic cycle in Latin America, that's not like the cycle in Europe. It's not savings investment which is driving the economy, 
but it's the external sector, export, import. If there is the boom in the developed world, commodity exports will boom, and if there is a slump, commodity exports will fall down. And so it's the external sector which is driving the economy in these countries. And so if you want to stabilize the economy, you need international liquidity. And this will become the key theme of Triffin. In his first essay, 1946, you need international liquidity to stabilize the economy. And it will become the key theme in gold and the dollar, dollar crisis, the book which made Triffin famous. And there it's also, we need, uh, we are in the 1960s, the 50s, we, the economy is expanding, and Triffin says, we need more international reserves. And then he looks at the international monetary system, the Bretton Woods, the gold exchange standard. What is the international liquidity? Well, it's gold, but mainly American dollars and a little bit British pounds. And then he says, we cannot have this. This is a very vulnerable system because the international liquidity is the currencies of different countries. This is a very vulnerable system. And from there, he will develop the, the Triffin dilemma. And so he says, well, for an expanding economy, you, you need more dollars. And so the United States must put more dollars into the international economy. But the, the coverage, the gold, well, stays the same or goes down. And so at a certain moment, people will ask to convert the dollars into gold and the system will implode. And, and there, this is the, the Triffin dilemma. And, and so Triffin's proposal is an international currency. One gets to it with the Rio Agreement 1967, creation of the, single, of the um, special drawing rights. And Triffin says, well, mixed reaction. Because, well, okay, there is an international currency, but this international currency, uh, the national currencies, the dollar, the pound sterling, are still there. So the fundamental problems of the system are not resolved. And also, distribution of the SDRs, it's via the quotas. The richest countries get most of the SDRs, he says. No, this is not correct. We should issue SDRs to finance development. And so you see we are still in these debates uh, at these years now. Now, Triffin, uh, Plan A did not function, but he was already also an, uh, very much in favor of regional monetary integration. And, and so Triffin, he was at the Federal Reserve, 1946, International Monetary Fund is created, and Triffin was one of the first economists at the IMF. He would become a head of unit for exchange controls in the research department, and, and there very much the Marshall Plan, European recovery is central, and Triffin, he becomes the first um, IMF representative, uh, representative in Europe. And, and there he is in Paris then, the discussions are going on for the European Payments Union. And there, uh, it's really Triffin who will come up with the formula for the unit of account. Because he was really condemning the bilateral trade. He wanted to get this multilateral clearing. You need a unit of account. And Triffin came with the formula which was acceptable to everybody. And then this European Payments Union, this will be Triffin's model. Triffin's model for regional integration, Europe as the most successful, but also for Latin America, Asia, Africa. And, and so, uh, what are key elements? Well, he wants a European reserve fund. European reserve fund, and he says we could pool uh, international reserves. 10% of the international reserves of the central banks. You can imagine the reaction of the central banks on that. They were not completely happy with it. Um, but so the idea is we should pool reserves. And then if we pool reserves, we can uh, have different types of operations, assistance of countries in who have troubles. And then you need a unit of account. And if you see this construction, 
pooling resources to help countries in, in troubles, well, it's the same paradigm of European stability mechanism, which you have there, the idea of driven solidarity. Um, now, this idea for a European reserve and Triffin would be very much propagating. And Triffin, he was very close to Marjolin, to Monet. And so Triffin became the monetary expert of Werner's uh, Action Committee for the United States of Europe. Who was also in that committee? Pierre Werner. And as all the work of Elena Danescu has shown, uh, this, all this interrelation, Triffin, Werner, uh, Monet, they, they were really working together. How can we make progress towards a federal Europe? And um, so Triffin, um, he, he, he made the brand plan for the Hague summit. Monet asked him to follow the whole uh, Werner committee work, so he was in very close contact. And so Triffin has been throughout the whole European history launching these ideas for the European Reserve Fund. Other key element of, of Triffin, a European currency. Hmm? You needed a European currency as a unit of account in the European Payments Union. And then he quickly goes on the idea, and you see he is very much we should favor the monetary pillar. Well, we could develop the function of this currency in the official sphere, between the central banks, but also privately. Privately, he writes this in a note. Two days later, Colin of the Credit Bank calls him. That's a good idea. Can we do it? And so Triffin, he becomes an administrator of Credit Bank Luxembourg, where you have the first, 1961, the first issue, which one could consider as the first eurobond issue, in the unit of account for a Portuguese society organized by Credit Bank Luxembourg. And Credit Bank, together with other uh, financial institutions, they will really develop this EQ market, which was very much uh, a niche market in Luxembourg. Now, Triffany is really focused on this monetary and much less attention to what should be the institutional structure of the central bank, what should be the economic pillar of the economic and monetary union, much less attention to that. So it's really in this monetarist um, advance. So conclusion, uh, Triffin, famous for transient analysis of the Bretton Woods system, a great partisan of regional monetary integration. And, and he was a brilliant utopist, eh? shaping the intellectual and, and policy debates. Thank you very much. I invite now the first keynote speaker, Mr. Jacques de la Rosière, for the conference entitled Emu Myth or Reality. Mr. Jacques de la Rosière is a former governor of the Banque de France, former managing director of the International Monetary Fund, and former president of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Altesse royale, je vous salue parce que vous avez participé il y a longtemps, lorsque j'étais directeur général du Fonds monétaire international, à une année d'initiation. Et je me souviens de votre venue et je voulais vous saluer tout particulièrement ce soir. Je veux également remercier tous les organisateurs de cette soirée, l'Université de Luxembourg, le centre culturel euh, qui, qui nous abrite et euh, l'ambassadrice de France qui a bien voulu venir à cette séance. Je vais vous présenter une vue qui n'est pas une vue convenue. Et c'est une vue que l'on peut 
critiquer, que l'on peut considérer comme euh, inexacte. Mais c'est celle qui s'est dégagée de ma réflexion sur le sujet qui m'était présenté, celui de l'avenir de l'euro. À la demande des organisateurs, je vais passer à l'anglais euh, et j'espère pouvoir me, me faire comprendre dans cette langue qui n'est pas la mienne. The specificity of the euro currency is that it is not an overwhelming symbol of unity, but more a permanent source of issues to negotiate for the member states of the Eurozone. A national and sovereign currency usually constitutes a synthesis of the economy of a given country. It reflects the relation between the given country and the international system and is part of the necessary dialogue between the fiscal and monetary authorities of the country. To put it bluntly, the currency is normally the catalyst of a country's unity. When you think of the United States economy, you think of the dollar. When you think of the UK economy, you think of the sterling. I would like to be able to say that when you think of the European Union, you think of the Euro. Now, for sure, the Euro has been a success in so far as it has become the second most important currency globally after the American dollar. Indeed, in 1999, the Euro became the single currency of a vast economic entity whose market of 350 million inhabitants is one of the largest in the world. Exchange rates have disappeared by design and the share of the euro across various indicators of international currency continued to average close to 20% in 2022. But this success cannot conceal the deep internal divisions within the monetary union. If one takes a close look at the euro, one can perceive that, unlike other currencies, it is far from being the reflection of a country's unity. The euro has gone through dramatic turmoil during the European sovereign debt crisis and is regularly source and manifestation of some discord among member states. Why is that? I think there are several reasons. The first reason is that there are as many fiscal policies in the Union as there are members of the Eurozone itself. The second reason is that there are heterogeneous perceptions of the inflation that must be fought. Northern countries are less prone to inflation than southern countries. The third one is that the key interest rate of the euro is the same for all members of the monetary zone. It is an average, which by definition is more tolerant for countries with higher inflation than for those who have a more stable outcome. And the fourth one is that the Union has moved since the 60s from structural European policies, industrial, agriculture, energy, towards a single market with no community preferences and with strong national trends. In short, the handling of the single currency is a matter of permanent discussions between the members of the boards of the ECB and the Euro group. My first part is about growing heterogeneities. One can say that the members of the Union 
are better off today than they were when they entered the monetary union because the per capita revenue has increased. But I have an objection to this. Yes, per capita revenues have increased, but most of them, not all, but most of them are the result of public borrowing and redistribution. Are you richer when you have been re redistributed funds that have been borrowed on the market? It's a question. I don't think that's higher homogeneity at all. In terms of growth, the Eurozone has been lagging behind the United States for decades. Since 1995, the accumulated level of real GDP has risen by 94% in the United States compared to only 51% in the Eurozone. So we are lagging in terms of growth. The euro has strengthened the more industrialized countries to the detriment of those in deeper industrial decline. This is an important part of the demonstration. The elimination of foreign exchange risks normally encourages productive spe specialization within a monetary union. This turned out to be true only for certain member states of the Eurozone. The single currency has given an edge to exporting countries that specialized in tradable products for which they exhibit a strong competitiveness, such as Germany, Austria, over countries that have progressively experienced deindustrialization, such as France and Spain. Indeed, the economies of the best performing countries benefit from the fact that the external value of the euro represents an average for the entire economic area and appears undervalued in relation to their own economic performance, resulting in an additional competitive advantage. For example, it is estimated by the IMF that Germany's exchange rate is 20% undervalued in terms of real effective exchange rate relative to the euro area at large. So Germany is helped by a low currency, if I could put it that way, and therefore its advantage in terms of industrialization is all the bigger. The Eurozone macroeconomic divergence is especially conspicuous when looking at the target two imbalances. Indeed, the net target two liabilities of the Bank of Italy and the Bank of Spain are quite high, standing at respectively 623 billion and 422 billion euros in May 2023. Conversely, the Bundesbank has a net target to credit of more than 1,000 billion, 1 trillion euros in May 2023. It has been forgotten that a monetary union does not erase current account imbalances, which remain, by definition, national. So even though we have a monetary union and have a single currency, the monetary reality is different. The value of the euro minus inflation is highly volatile, depending on different member states. The divergence in public debt levels across member states is a major concern and getting bigger and bigger. The public debt to GDP ratio has continued to grow steadily in significant countries like France, 112% of GDP, Italy, Belgium, Spain, and is approaching and even sometimes exceeding 120% of their GDP. On the contrary, 
countries such as the Netherlands, Germany, Austria have been able to maintain a ratio of public debt to GDP of about 60% or less in recent years. So on one side, 100% or more, on the other side, 60% or less. Disparities are also striking in terms of public deficit. In, 20, in 2022, when Germany and the Netherlands have managed to, to have a public deficit below the 3% threshold, France, Spain, and Italy have exceeded the 3% threshold by respectively minus 4.7, minus 4.8, and minus 8% of GDP. As Mr. Luis de Guindos recently said, I quote him, after four years without EU fiscal rules, governments may have got used to a little bit of whatever it takes approach with respect to fiscal policy, end of quote. But that has to change. Having a tightening of monetary policy and simultaneously an expansion of a fiscal policy would be a very bad policy mix, adds Mr. Luis de Guindos. Current account balances are another indicator of the heterogeneities of the euro area. In 1922, Germany and the Netherlands had current account surpluses, which were very significant. 4.2% in Germany, 5.5% of GDP in the Netherlands, whereas France, Belgium, Greece had important structural deficits of 1.7%, 3.4%, and 9.7%, which is huge. Regarding inflation in Europe, there were two discernible zones during the 2000s, one where inflation was rather high, like in Spain and Italy, and one where inflation was rather low, and Germany and the Netherlands. In other words, while the objective of, main, of maintaining an inflation rate similar to the one observed before the global financial crisis, that is towards 2% of G per, per year, that objective was on average attained. It remains that the peripheral countries, as we say, who had let their inflation soar their budgetary deficits derail and their real estate markets explode had, in a way, taken advantage, quote unquote, of the low interest rate of the ECB, whose rates were obviously too low for those, while they were more in line with the needs of the more stable core countries of the Eurozone. Consequently, the current account balance of countries with high inflation have deteriorated during the 2000s. Meanwhile, countries that had contained inflation had positive real interest rates and current account surpluses, encouraging them to be even more virtuous, quote unquote, in their fight against inflation. The monetary system has thus pushed countries towards one extreme to the other, depending on their economic discipline. The stronger got stronger, and the weaker got weaker. Finally, the reality of the European single market has not favored more economic coherence. A single market is an essential objective, but it does not improve the homogeneity and economic performance of all member states in itself. It would only have positive results for all member states, advanced and less advanced, if structural reforms were generalized, which is not the case. Cross-border capital flows within the Eurozone have been limited since the European sovereign debt crisis of 2010. 
Additionally, until 2008, European cross-border capital flows mainly fueled unproductive asset bubbles, like in Spain and Ireland. The ECB interest rates have been structurally lower than the Fed's American interest rates for 15 years, which leads to capital flight from the Eurozone, less well remunerated, to finance the rest of the world, and in particular the United States. The accentuated economic divergences between member states can indeed scare investors away as they have better remunerated and less risky opportunities elsewhere, especially in the United States. The EU banking market remains fragmented, notably due to home host issues and ring fencing practices from host countries. The capital market union, which is so much desired, remains a dream. The absence of a European safe financial asset due to the absence of a common fiscal policy is also an important factor. It is therefore important to promote integrated banking and financial markets where excess savings from northern countries could finance necessary investments in southern countries, which would foster not only growth in Europe and the international role of the euro, but also the European strategic autonomy in the financial area. But unfortunately, this does not work due to the increasing economic divergences between member states. To overcome the inherent contradiction of the heterogeneity of the monetary zone, that should have been at least, there should have been at least an element of macroprudential surveillance. This has always staggered me. I'm going to explain it. In the 2000s, simple non-monetary regulatory measures, such as loan to value, down payments, by borrowers for loans, which can be increased if you want to lessen the intensity of lending, would have been effective measures, very simple to take, not even carrying a difficult decision by the ECB to increase interest rates. And that would have prevented bubbles. We missed out this macro prudential phase. It is already difficult to manage a single monetary policy with strong economic divergences. And it's even more difficult if we don't use the simple measures known as macroprudential measures, which would have made it possible, in particular, to attenuate the problems of financial instability in the 2000s. The, I'm coming to my second point which is also controversial, but uh, never mind. The ultra-loose monetary policy in the euro area has disincentivized member states to undertake structural reforms and has led to fiscal dominance. The delicate arrangement of the European construction, largely illusory, depended very much on the maintenance of zero interest rate policy from the ECB to make public deficits easily financeable, which is what we did for 15 years. Keeping interest rates at zero during such a long period reduced the financial difficulties caused by the emergence of spreads and the public deficits. But it encouraged general indebtedness as well as the vulnerability of the financial system. And they have disincentivized member states to undertake necessary structural measures. It's the case in France and Italy. The fact that the ECB has gone so far on the fiscal issue 
You must have in mind that the euro system holds more than 30% of the outstanding public debt of the zone, sheds a rather dark light on the concept of independence of the central banks. Monetary policy can erase spread differentials into the euro area, but can neither solve domestic problems nor relaunch capital flows from the north to the south. Indeed, since the EU sovereign debt crisis, member states with excess savings like Germany and Netherlands no longer finance investment projects in lower per capita GDP countries like Spain, Italy, Portugal, Greece. This is notably due to the interest rate differential between the US and Europe. The risk is better remunerated in the US than in Europe, and there is less inconsistencies. The limited financial flows between the euro currencies the insufficient number of investment projects and the absence of a true European industrial policy are among <laughs> the factors that explain this. By setting medium and long-term interest rates in an administrative matter, manner, central banks have crossed a crucial boundary, in my view, that of intervening in the allocation of resources and the distribution of wealth without letting the market define interest rate equilibria based on the supply and demand of capital. In fact, our central banks have systematically favored debtors over creditors. You could borrow at 0%, but you had to provide your money at 0% also. Are we still in the realm of monetary policy. I have my doubts. Now, the debt servicing costs are rising, along with the interest rates, and are becoming heavy on highly indebted countries' budgets, leaving them with really little room for maneuver. Without efforts to comply with the fiscal discipline required by a monetary union, the sustainability of the debts of certain member states could be questioned. When the ECB buys financial securities in a Himalayan way, mountains of buying, it is by definition running a risk, risk of the intrinsic value of the asset that they buy, the risk of default by the debtor, and an interest rate risk if interest rates were to increase after the buying of these low interest rate securities. If the central bank has miscalculated its risk, for instance, by underestimating inflation dangers, or forcing rates to zero while financial bubbles are already inflating and banging at the door, it is preparing a crisis. And this is exactly what happened. In the ascending phase of QE, governments were very happy with the fall in interest rates and the rise in treasury securities. But as soon as inflation reappeared and rates had to be raised, governments became worrisome. Borrowing would cost them more and they would have to make up the central bank's deficits through recapitalization and suffer the consequences of rising interest rates. What goes around comes around. A political agenda that encourages fundamental economic divergence is one that turns its back on reality. And when one turns its, your back on reality, the spreads of interest rates on the markets tend to increase, and the spreads for the least competitive countries, 
the worst hit by the crisis, tend to jump. As long as it, it is not sufficiently understood, especially in highly indebted countries, that over indebtedness is a source of under competitiveness and higher spreads. The economic situation in these countries will continue to deteriorate and it will be all the more difficult to make progress in the, in the construction of an economic and financial Europe. Indeed, the intensity of fiscal and economic divergences between EU countries makes it more difficult to define in Europe a common interest, encourages a policy of every man for himself, creates a climate of mistrust between member states, which hinders progress in terms of public and private risk sharing and weakens the Eurozone. I'll end now with some necessary improvements, which I think are required to face the challenges ahead of the EMU. Monetary policy should be normalized to fight inflation. ECB should, in my view, pursue the normalization of monetary policy, which it has, which it has started to fight inflation. Inflation remains persistent and elevated, even if it has significantly reduced over the last months. As long as real interest rates are negative, which they are in the Eurozone, it is still a reward for getting more into debt. However, should the monetary policy take into account the possible financial fragmentation that exists in the Eurozone? The fear of the reappearance of spreads in Europe should, in my view, this is a personal view, should not dominate the decision-making process of monetary policy. Indeed, sooner or later, structural spreads based on the past accumulation of fiscal and structural deficiencies in Europe will appear on the markets. The ECB is certainly rightly concerned with moderating excessive, quote unquote, market rate differential between European countries. But central banks do not have an obligation to systematically erase all traces of interest rate differences as they are appreciated by the markets. The elimination of all spreads would be difficult to reconcile with the Maastricht Treaty as some member states, known for their fiscal discipline, place greater emphasis on the objective of monetary stability, believing that the ECB should not monetize public debt. Monetary policy cannot solve structural issues. Member states are the ones who must adjust their economic and fiscal policies accordingly to address their domestic economic weaknesses. I, it would make sense to start decisively a quantitative tightening monetary policy in order to undo the excessive liquidity that has accumulated during the years of monetary accommodation and weighs very strongly on the present liquidity environment. The review of the Stability and Growth Pact needs to be ambitious and immediately effective to avoid a looming euro crisis. The goal of the EU fiscal framework was to unify the economic environment in which monetary policy operates. Thus, there is a need to replace fiscal dominance with a gradual convergence of the various fiscal policies of the euro area member states. If the fragmentation that currently characterizes European fiscal policy persists, then the EMU is in a deadlock 
and the situation will be going from bad to worse. The case-by-case -case framework proposed by the EU legislative proposal is, in my view, a right approach, in particular the speed of the return to a public debt below 60% of GDP should be specifically adjusted to each country. A set of rules adapted to each problem, in some cases too much expenditure, in some cases need for a primary surplus. A set of rules adapted is necessary in order to acknowledge national economic specificity. The methodology used must be unique and indisputable. The countries with large deficits and over-indebtedness should achieve and maintain a primary surplus to be defined and monitored by the EU Commission or an independent EU fiscal authority. In this perspective, primary fiscal balances should become a quantitative benchmark to support the EU reformed fiscal framework, as well as the comparison of the ratio of public expenditure to GDP with the average of the Eurozone. When I was at the IMF, we had adjustment programs every day. I mean, what I have just said from the Stability and Growth Pact was, was the common daily Ma you know, main job of the IMF. And I remember very well, in some cases, of the type of those that I have described here with the fiscal crisis that we, we are running, the IMF had to resort, in negotiation with the countries, of course, to adjustments where that were in the order of three or four percentage points of GDP per year, not one percent, more than that. And uh, I think we're going to have to think, uh, with the assistance of uh, Monsieur Garmenia, we're going to have to think of the calibration, the right calibration of these actions. Because uh, if you lose 20% in terms of your deficit to GDP because of a crisis. And then you're told, oh, yes, but you can only do 1% a year. It means that you will need 20 years to go back to the situation where you were before. That's what uh, Monsieur Gravenier was telling me just before the meeting. And he was, he was right. So we, we, we shouldn't have a, a prejudice. We shouldn't say, no, no, never more than 1% a year. It doesn't have any meaning. We have to look at the nature of the situation and the capability of the countries, of course, to deliver a program. Quality of public spending and composition of public finances must be given more importance than its quantity. But public investments should not be excluded from a country's deficit and debt calculations. The macroeconomic imbalance procedure, called MIP, needs to be rigorously respected, thanks to equal treatment and multilateral surveillance assured by an independent and dedicated commission. This macroeconomic imbalance procedure must be applied effectively and evenly, and I think of Triffin here, among all member states, creditors and debtors. This means that the adjustments of the current account balances should not only concern countries running deficits, but also countries running surplus, surpluses and structural surpluses. It is not possible, nor honest, to expect South countries to be the only ones to in, indefinitely scale down their revenues to compensate for the growing surpluses of northern countries. It is therefore high time to design and implement a symmetric adjustment mechanism where surpluses are addressed 
the same way deficits are. And here, the lesson given by Ivo Maas on Triffin is of great importance and complete actuality. The present complex situation where a monetary union is run without a credible mechanism dedicated to economic stability is not sustainable in the long term. Members must use their fiscal and structural policies to strengthen the cooperation that the Union needs. In the present circumstances, the European Union, with 27 members, is not presently willing to force economic convergence on member states in the name of a discipline that ultra-loose monetary policy discouraged. To break this contradiction, it is essential that the European executive power, and more precisely the Commission, assume their responsibilities regarding the respect of economic discipline. This requires independence, skills, vision, and courage from the leaders in charge of these economic topic topics with the Commission. As ECB Vice President Luis de Guindos has recently stated, and I will quote him second and last time, we are on our way towards 2% inflation. That's clear, said he. But, when, but we must monitor first very closely as the last mile is not going to be easy. The elements that might torpedo the disinflation process are powerful. This is, at the end of the day, a very delicate balance, said he. In the fiscal inflationary and economic drift, where if that drift were to continue in the euro area, we would end up making the virtuous countries, quote unquote, pay for the slippages. This would be the definition of a non-cooperative game where most players try to avoid their own obligations by shifting the cost to those who observe them. So we have to take the union destiny in our own hands and not let it drift. If this drift were to happen, the logical result would be an inevitable new crisis in, in our Eurozone. Thank you very much for your attention. Before presenting the co-keynote speaker, let me tell you that uh, this uh, event uh, is recorded by my colleagues of the Media Center of the University and the audiovisual recording as well as the texts that the invited speaker accepted to share with us will be published on the website of the Bridge Forum Dialogue and also on the research infrastructure of the university. Uh, now, I would like to introduce uh, you the co-keynote speaker, Mr. Pierre Gramenia, uh, held a diplomatic career spanning uh, for two decades, holding various posts, including ambassador of Luxembourg in Japan. Uh, then, uh, he was for a decade a director general of the Chamber of Commerce of Luxembourg, and more recently, for the decade too, uh, Minister of Finance of the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg and member of the ESM Board of Governors. Uh, Mr. Gaminia is Managing Director of the European Stability Mechanism since 1st December 2022 and CEO uh, of the European Financial Stability Facility since thir uh, 13 December uh, 2022. Mr. Gramenia will present the keynote entitled The Journey to the Euro and a Resilient Euro Area. Mr. Gramenia, the floor is yours.
Good evening, Your Royal and Highnesses, Excellencies, dear organizers, ladies and gentlemen, dear Jacques de la Rovière, de la Rosière, dear partners that have organized this event. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, and um, this is probably going to be one of the most challenging speeches uh, I will ever have had to deliver because um, I have to reveal a secret here. And the secret is that I did not know what Jacques de la Rosière would say. So I have a very well prepared speech which I'm going to partly deliver also because my team did a wonderful job in writing it together with me. But obviously, if I only speak uh, about what's written here, it might be a little bit frustrating for you because you will say, well, Jacques Delaurier has asked so many questions and Pierre Gramigna just read his speech as if he had not listened to him. So first, I want to be polite. Second, I want to be intellectually fair. Third, now I realize this is all going to be taped. And fourth, <laughs> that is going to be published. So to tell you the truth, this is nearly impossible. So out of intellectual honesty, I'm going to make a few references to what uh, Jacques de la Rosière has said. Uh, and it will be probably more general than what you expect, but that's the maximum I can do because all the questions he raised, which are obviously all completely justified and fair, would uh, uh, deserve probably hours uh, of answers. And in fact, as the university is uh, the main organizer here, I think would deserve certainly a one-year program for master students. Now, I, uh, as a convinced European, I'm very pleased to be uh, here with you to discuss about all these issues and uh, that I've been asked to be keynote speaker with Jacques de la Rosière, being myself a convinced European, uh, he an unparalleled convinced European with an unparalleled also experience at national, European, and international level. My task is really not easy. I really admire Jacques, your enthusiasm for the Euro area journey. That's how I have also called uh, or titled the title, The Journey of the Euro and a Resilient Euro Area. Now, what uh, this word journey inspired to me uh, when I reread this this morning is the quote by T.S. Eliot, the, uh, the American uh, writer and philosopher who said, the journey, not the destination, matters. And I think, Jacques, you probably disagree with it in the sense that you think that the objectives are clear and we must reach those objectives. But then again, there's a case, and you will see that a little bit in my presentation, there's a case to say you cannot reach the objectives immediately, in the short term, in the medium term. Sometimes it takes a, a lot of time. It takes a whole journey. Let me also say here that it took the United States decades to have a dollar that was recognized and accepted on the whole of the United States. And so I think it is therefore important that um, we also see that uh, the construction of a common currency was something that took a lot of time. Um, so I will spend a little bit of time with history, uh, although uh, Dana Danescu has already done part of it. I will just stay on a few uh, places in history that are very important and that are useful for, for, for the discussion here. We are celebrating the 30th anniversary of the EU single market this year. Uh, it, it started in 1993. Now, the EU single market is much more than a sherry on the cake on uh, what was uh, the intention of the founding fathers who had agreed on a customs uh, union and uh, had uh, agreed 
uh, on the free flow of people, of uh, goods, of capital, and of services. Uh, we thought we had uh, that already in the original Treaty of Rome, but let's face it, it's only when Jacques Delors, and here we, we jump from 1950s to 1984-5, when Jacques Delors and his commission uh, embarked on, on the project of the single currency that we realized how much was still to do. And then came um, in 1989 the fall of the Berlin Wall and an incredible acceleration uh, in uh, the single market project on the one hand and uh, what I would call a kind of political decision to go ahead with the common currency. So this is now really very fast. I would like to, to dwell obviously a little bit more on history by underlining the role that Pierre Werner's report has played, has been illustrated uh, uh, before uh, very eloquently. Uh, when Pierre Werner uh, mentioned the idea of a common currency uh, in his report, in the report that bears his name in 1970, I think everybody thought, or most people thought, this is a dream. This is visionary. And if you had asked me in, in 1970, while well, I was 12 years old, if I believed in it, I would probably as a child say yes, but all economists and experts would say, we're not going to see this in a lifetime. But we have seen it uh, in a lifetime and much faster than we expected. Now, and here I, I do a deviation a bit for, of the speech to, to uh, look into something which is really key and which uh, is uh, a red thread in, in the presentation of Jacques de La Rosière, uh, and which is the following. The main argument against a common currency back in the 70s, 80s, uh, and beginning of the 90s was the following. Economists saying you cannot have a common currency if you have different budget policy, different fiscal policies, and different macroeconomic policies in the countries. You first have to ensure that before you can have a common currency. And others were saying, politically, we want this common currency. We think it's going to make Europe stronger. Let's do it. And uh, I'm going, and I'm so happy that Yves Mersch is here, he and I, and he much more than I, uh, contributed uh, to the work of the Maastricht Treaty, which uh, put into place the process that led to the common currency back in 1991 under Luxembourg presidency. And you were very at the heart of it yourself. As a young diplomat, I, I was also there. And uh, what we were able to do uh, was pushed by the fact that we felt with the fall of the Berlin Wall, this is a unique opportunity to achieve it. But many people were saying, you're putting the cart in front of the horse. But looking back, I would say it was the right decision. Because we still see how difficult it is today to align macroeconomic policies and fiscal policies 20 years into the monetary union, do you really think that if we had not created to the common currency that uh, this would have been possible? So I think we are closer now in aligning our macroeconomic policies and fiscal policies because we have the euro. If we wouldn't have the euro, nothing would have happened. In fact, to put it even more bluntly or more directly, I would put it this way. How would Europe have reacted in the last 15 years if we would not have had the euro? I think the European Union would not exist anymore. Because the common currency is what really glues us together. The common currency is, many say it, and I believe it too, is what gives us a huge likelihood that our union is irreversible. So this is more a political comment, but it is a very important one. Look, in many countries, 
uh, and I'm not going to mention uh, them one by one, the opposition to the common currency in the last 10 years has receded a lot. Many parties, extreme right, extreme left, often, but not only, were against the common currency and said if they would get to power, they would take their country out of the euro area. But in the recent past, the acceptance of the euro in the public and in the parties has grown a lot. And in fact, where we have seen it most clearly was in the Greek crisis or in the 10 years uh, um, past when uh, also the ESM was uh, founded. Let me maybe insist here on, on what really happened. Uh, when the European Monetary Union was uh, uh, launched uh, and entered into force in 1999 and then in 2002 with, uh, with the banknotes and, and the coins, we were in a period where we've had growth. Fortunately, the 90s, very positive, very little crisis in Europe. And then we have a lot of growth until 2007. So it's only when the uh, international financial crisis started in the United States back in 2007 and then came to Europe that we started to realize that we had weaknesses in the system and that we had holes uh, like, uh, like you have in the Emmental cheese. And, uh, you know, the, the, the holes, you only see them in, in times of necessity, in times of crisis. And, uh, in fact, when a few countries, uh, I'm going to mention them, had then difficulties uh, to refinance their debt, or a few countries had problems uh, because their banks were weakened, which was then lead to major problems also for, for, for the budget and for the country itself, what normally would happen is that the countries would go to the IMF, but the amounts of money that were necessary were even too high for the IMF. And the second thing that was is that we thought, oh, if we have a solidarity amongst ourselves with the common currency, well, we should have a crisis instrument for ourselves, which was not planned. So this is the context in, in which uh, it happened. I should also underline that in the Maastricht Treaty, it is foreseen that uh, the central European Central Bank or national central banks are not allowed to bail out their governments, their country. And second, that countries could not bail out other countries, to, to put it in simple words. So there was no way to help a country that had problems, and that's why the ESM, European Stability Mechanism, was created. It was first the EFSF, which was a transitional institution which was set up very quickly in 2010, and then the International Financial Institution, ESM, uh, was founded. Now, uh, just to underline something which maybe gets a little bit lost with the word European Stability Mechanism is the following. I recently attended a, a conference where a Belgian uh, judge uh, uh, Wattele came to Luxembourg and he presented the jurisprudence of the uh, European Court of Justice singling out um, the most important uh, cases that were solved. And then he also mentioned the Pringle case, which basically solidified the legal basis uh, of uh, the ESM. And so it was a general public and say, the ESM, you know, this is the European solidarity mechanism. Lapsus. Nobody noticed. Luckily, I was in the room. And at the end, I, uh, I asked the question. No, I asked the question. I said, uh, Mr. Watley, uh, uh, you, you, this, this was a typo, or, but uh, we are not called European solidarity mechanism. We are called European stability mechanism. But I just say, your lapsus is phenomenal because when you help another country, yes, you are in an act of solidarity. So this ESM that was created in 2012 strengthens, obviously, the monetary uh, union. And uh, let's be happy that we have it. And so maybe in a nutshell, also for the public, uh, the ESM has uh, financially uh, supported uh, five countries, uh, Spain, Portugal, Ireland, uh, Cyprus, and the 
the most famous case is Greece, because Greece received by far the largest amount. And um, the way the SM does that is not by, by giving out money. We have a paid in capital by the member countries of more than 80 billion euro. And those 80 billion euro give us a potential of borrowing on the markets a firepower of 500 billion euros. So we go on the markets, and because we have highly capitalized, we have the AAA rating by all rating agencies, and we make the countries that receive support benefit from this AAA rating. So it doesn't cost the taxpayer anything. So it's a very wise uh, system. And uh, as I said, we have uh, financed and refinanced 300 billion euro. And our lending capacity today, with all the things we have already done, is, already, is still 417 billion euro. So quite a lot of firepower, by the way. It is the, highly, the highest capitalized uh, international financial institution in the world. It's good. Our predecessors were wise because they wanted that, thanks to the ESM, we safeguard the uh, European, uh, European Union and particularly the Euro area. Now, <coughs> sorry, after the financial crisis of 2010, which went up with the Greek crisis to 2015, we all thought that we would be out of the woods. Now, what we have seen since then is that the crisis come much faster than in the past. So since the financial crisis of 2010, we've had uh, the um, uh, COVID pandemic, and uh, that was 2020 and 21, and then now the war uh, in Ukraine after the terrible and unacceptable aggression of Russia, which has triggered high energy prices has spurred inflation. But the two last crises, pandemic and um, war uh, on the European continent, have both contributed to launch inflation. We have lived 10 years in a kind of situation where inflation was extremely low. In the eight years I attended the uh, Eurogroup and the ECOFIN, most of the time, the European Central Bank will tell us, yes, I mean, we have now 1% inflation. We're getting there. We're getting to the 2%. We were desperately seeking to get to the 2%. That tells you how the state of mind has changed. And unluckily, what happened uh, was that inflation started to grow fast. And that's really the scenario that nobody would have wanted. And uh, it has forced the uh, European Central Bank to increase uh, interest rates uh, quite fast, as you all know. And uh, that is obviously slowing down the economy. Up to now, we have managed to have a, what, you, what we call a soft landing uh, and avoid recession. Uh, let's hope it stays like that. We have shallow growth, zero point something as an average uh, in the, the euro area, but uh, the jury is still out there if we're really going to be able to uh, avoid recession. So, um, staying with uh, what you said, uh, Jacques de la Rosière, uh, I'd like to, to make two comments and then I'm going to explain in the second part all the other improvements that have been done in Europe after also the, the European stability mechanism and talk a little bit uh, where we stand in the negotiation with the Stability and Growth Pact. Um, it, is, uh, it is so that uh, you said the, the euro divides Europe. As I said before, I think it's to a certain extent, the contrary, that's true. It, it makes sure that we must find a way for a solution, that we must cooperate. And 
I would like to give two or three examples where this has really happened. I mean, uh, Spain has the, the presidency of the EU right now, and we went to Santiago de Compostela, where the informal meeting was, and I could see the, the highways, the freeways uh, in Spain. Uh, I also drove a little bit through Portugal. When you see the infrastructure in those countries, and I had been in Portugal back in 1987, I mean, this is a success story. How I would say that Portugal and Spain are among the best examples of a successful enlargement. And you cannot deny that. You go there and you see it. Um, there's so many other things I could say about those two countries. Uh, but I, I, I just want to say it is not completely fair to say that GDP uh, per capita is not telling. You go to these countries and you see how much Europe has strengthened them, how much the EU single market helps them. Obviously, there's cohesion funds and so on, uh, and helped by the EU, but those countries now have better infrastructure. Imagine, Portugal is the country that has, I think with one of the Scandinavian countries, the highest percentage of renewable energy. So there's a lot of hope. Uh, so I think that the GDP per capita and infrastructure that you can see in this country tell a very positive story. But then another one I need to highlight, which is really key, is the NGEU. Uh, project, the uh, New Generation EU, which was decided uh, in April, uh, on April 9th uh, by finance ministers and then uh, confirmed and enlarged by prime ministers uh, in the middle of the COVID crisis. Who would have thought that we could agree at European level to mobilize 800 billion euro to be redistributed over the whole continent, taking into account the strengths and the weaknesses of all. Just because we were facing a type of crisis that we were not used to, to which we didn't know how we would be able to respond. And um, this program is rolling out, it goes until 2026. It is difficult to know if uh, such an endeavor and ambitious program will be repeated. But, and that question remains in the air, but what is clear is that thanks to that, we are again modernizing all of the EU by mobilizing uh, funds for uh, green investments and for the digitalization, which is the double transition priority that uh, the EU ha has agreed upon. So I would say that these examples uh, highlight that our predecessor and the founding fathers of, of the Euro were right to put the cart in front of the horse. Now, I don't know if would, I would have bet at the time, but now with retrospect, I would say that definitely that was the right answer. Now, Royal Highnesses, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is clear that the journey is not finished. A, a lot still needs to be done. And uh, uh, today I, I'm wearing one of my favorite uh, ties because it's a tie, you cannot see that, with snails, escargot on it because that's uh, not only the pace of, of the Procession d'Echternach, but it's uh, also sometimes the pace at which Europe acts and moves further. But let's face it, in the, the crisis of the last three years, Europe, he, Europe has been much faster than usual. And the NGEU program I just mentioned is maybe the best uh, case in point. But uh, work remains to be done. I will just give a few uh, highlights and then uh, concluding uh, with uh, where we stand with interest rates and the uh, economic governance review. The banking union. When I started as a finance minister was uh, December 2013. That was the day where the banking union uh, was agreed. Uh, and in fact, fulfilling your, the wishes of the report that bears your name, the La Rosière report, most of the things that Jacques de La Rosière had suggested 
are taken care of, most. And so I was very happy. It was my first ECOFIN, and we finished at midnight. There was champagne. I said, this is a nice group here. Works fine. And the next day, I read in the newspaper. I thought newspapers would say, great, there's agreement on the banking union. Not at all. They'd say, they agreed on the framework of the banking union, but they're never going to deliver on it. That's what the press would say. I'm happy to say that we have delivered on three quarters of the banking union. And then again, you could say that's not enough. Yeah, but we have delivered on single supervising mechanism. That means the largest, 125 largest banks of Europe are supervised the same way by the European Central Bank. Uh, we have um, been able uh, to make the buffers uh, and the reserves of banks stronger. In the crisis of 2009 and 10, uh, the banks were the weak spot in the crisis. In, in the last couple of years, the banks of Europe were solid. Remember what happened this year in March with the regional banks in the United States that were weak and uh, Credit Suisse that was absorbed by, uh, you, you know, the Banque Suisse because it was nearly collapsing, and the whole Euro area and the whole European Union remained very stable. So it shows that the banking union is working, but let's face it, there's still no common uh, guarantee for, for deposits, so we need to work on that. So uh, there's work ahead, there's thing, and also the resolution uh, of banks and the national systems uh, in case of failures, need to be uh, more coordinated. You mentioned the home host issue, uh, one that, uh, as a finance minister of Luxembourg, I followed very closely. I think there are solutions there. But the solutions must be balanced. What I mean by that is you cannot just say all the reserves of the bank, all the liquidity of the bank is in the home country, and the subsidiaries are naked. So we need to find a system that is credible. And because we have lived for such a crisis back in 2009. So I think with goodwill, that can be solved too. You've mentioned rightly the Capital Markets Union. And here may be a few words also for those who do not follow this on an everyday basis. In the United States, three quarter of investments are financed by the stock exchange by equity market. And one quarter is financed through banks. In Europe, it's the opposite. Banks finance three quarter of investments and the markets only one quarter. So here, just to put in the perspective, when we say we need a, a stronger capital markets union, it doesn't mean that we want to um, make, uh, uh, to weaken Banks, not at all. Banks should continue to play the, the strong role they play in Europe. But obviously, we're so far behind in, in using the potential of capital markets because we have fragmented national markets, different regulations. So we must boost capital markets, having more common regulation, and keep strong banks that will continue to deliver uh, uh, funds to, to modernize uh, our economies. Um, and uh, so let me get to what is on the mind of those, uh, of all the finance ministers and prime ministers of uh, uh, Europe right now, is how can we modernize the stability and growth pact? So the topic is called, because Europe loves acronyms, it's called Economic Governance Review. If not, if you're not living in that world, you don't know what we're talking about. But Europe is loves such acronyms. Um, the Stability and Growth Pact, as the word says, insisted first on the word stability and not sufficiently on the word growth. In fact, I have even in one or two Eurogroups suggested we should call the new Stability and Growth Pact the Sustainable Growth and Stability Pact. Because growth alone is not sufficient, it needs to be sustainable, green on the one hand, and if you have no growth, you will have no financial stability. So here, we should do an inversion of the 
the, the letters. And this is being recognized. We must improve the, the new pact by making investments more likely, encouraging countries to innovate. And the EU, to a certain extent, is already showing us the way uh, of, of how to do that. So that's one thing. But the second thing that we have noticed is obviously that the Stability and Growth Pact was over the many years it was in place, only respected on the, in the whole period by one country, the one in which we're sitting. So Germany did not respect it, uh, France did not comply with it at certain times, so many countries were sinners, let's call it that way, or were deviating because of national situation or general situation. So when you have rules that nobody can comply with, then you definitely need to amend them. So there is consensus that we need to improve them. And we as uh, uh, European Stability Mechanism, we support that uh, endeavor and we say that the new rules need to fulfill three things which are easy to remember. The rules must be transparent and understandable, measurable, so that you can understand if a country does or does not comply with the rules. So a transparent system. The present system is very complex. The second one is that the system must be credible, and it must be credible for the market. It's not sufficient that it is credible for the member states and for the finance ministers who live, obviously, uh, in, in a political sphere, markets must believe that what we will agree, or what the 27 countries will agree, is done in such a way that countries can comply. And third, quite important, is there needs be equal treatment of all the countries. So for us, these are the, the three main elements that need to be in place with the new uh, governance with the new Stability and Growth Pact, where I hope that uh, uh, in the last minute we find an, a nice new name. Let me finish by something which um, is uh, not uh, covered here in my note, but because you spoke a long time about it, and you, rightly so. I mean, you made lots of comments, uh, Jacques Delaroziere, on the monetary policy uh, of the central bank. Now, by definition, um, when you have an, an official job like mine, you do not comment the ECB. Obviously, you're a free person, uh, and you do that. And I would like to say a few things uh, on the topic. Um, the first thing is the monetary policy. Let me quote, let's, let me start with this. Let me quote. Mario Draghi often said, when he was uh, at the head of the ACB, he would say the following. We have now a monetary policy, he said, with the zero interest rate or even negative interest rate, that is helping you countries a lot in this difficult phase. But the monetary policy cannot do it all. That was his sentence. And then he would add, you need to do your task which is act on your budgets, have better fiscal discipline. That he said. What he did not, and this is not a criticism, but there's a third element that you have rightly pointed out. The third element is structural reforms. Now, structural reforms, again, is one of these names. You don't know what it really means. I tell you what it is. Competitiveness. If you are not competitive, that means if your country cannot produce goods and services in a better way than most other countries, yeah, you'll not be good at exporting. You will not grow. So there is a triangle that we have to look at. Competitiveness, which you can achieve through structural reform and innovation, which will boost your growth. The second is uh, the fiscal discipline, or you can call it a reasonable a budget policy, and then there's the monetary policy. And so the ECB cannot do it alone. 
and the countries, the governments with their budget cannot do it alone. The economy must go along and you must have a framework in your country that helps your country being competitive. So that's the first thing I want to say. The second thing, the 10 years that we have lived through were in terms of monetary policy, a total innovation. I don't know if in world history there's ever been negative interest rates or 0% interest rates. It completely blurs the picture. It makes behavior unrational for people, for enterprises, and for governments. And I'm not criticizing, should really not be in, interpreted this way, that this has been done because it has proved efficient. But what we lack now is how is, is it going to go further? So the jury is out in how do you get out of this abnormal situation? And we don't know. And unfortunately, it happened very fast. You have called for a normalization of the monetary policy, and I think that's what the European Central Bank is doing right now. Both uh, on the interest rates and also on the assets on, that were purchased uh, by the central bank. I think that time horizon is the key here. We have the challenge of having inflation which has gone up very fast, interest rates that needed to go up very fast, and we need to have the right time horizon to stabilize the situation. So. Uh, it's not easy, uh, to the job of the European Central Bank. They have been courageous, I think, uh, to, to do what they did. And I think uh, they had probably no other option. And uh, I tend to say that uh, inflation is, the new term is inflation is sticky. I don't know who invented then. I prefer to say that numbers are stubborn, means more or less the same. Uh, Let's observe all of this and uh, let's not waste time in this crisis because the inflation, which is a result of many other things, is uh, the external sign of a crisis that we have to tackle. And despite my tie that uh, harbors a snail, I'm confident that Europe can act faster. Thank you very much. I invite the keynote speakers uh, and the moderator uh, to take a uh, seat. Uh, the uh, qu uh, question and answer session and the discussion with the audience will be uh, moderated by Professor Bernard Snois, who is chairman of the um, European League of Economic Cooperation, chairman of Robert Triffin International, and former executive director of the World Bank. Mics will circulate uh, in the conference room, so uh, you will uh, be able to address your question by raising the hand and briefly present yourself. Thank you. How much time do we have uh, since we are significantly behind the schedule? 20 minutes. Okay. Who would like to put a question either to Mr. De La Rosière or to Mr. Gramegna. There is one question there on the right side, upper right side. Please identify yourself and just put one question, not a long comment, please. Stronger, please. Louder, please. Yes.
my late, very close friend from Mandel. Right. <clears throat> a world currency, not a single currency. He wanted to call it Inter. And um, each country would produce still its own unit that would exchange at a par with the world unit. Do you think there's still a chance, a need for such um, world or international currency? Related to this, this about the Triffin dilemma. Uh, Professor Maas is still here. He, um, Professor Triffin argued that excessive U.S. deficit would um, erode the confidence okay. in the U.S. currency because of the uh, dollar glut. Yes. Then is um, is there such an um, erosion of confidence okay. today, and how to cope with it? it uh, pardon, I would no, I like would to uh, to ask a short question to yes. uh, Mr. De La Rosière. He talked about heterogeneity. Um, Thank you. Is there a growing heterogeneity uh, because of the enlargement, the coming one, the, the past one in recent okay. years? And how, Monsieur de la Rosière, how to cope with um, this growing heterogeneity? Okay. Uh, I think I will rephrase slightly the question, um, particularly in your most recent book, putting an end to the financial illusions. You show how the collapse of the um, uh, Bretton Woods system and the lack of answer to the Triffin dilemma uh, has a responsibility in leading us to the um, uh, over indebtedness and perhaps uh, has a bad impact on our attempts to build the European monetary and uh, economic union. I I agree very much with what you've said. The collapse of the Bretton Woods system has been uh, a very, very grave and very serious decision because in the old gold standard system, you had a element of discipline in the sense that you could not inflate your economy because if you did that, you couldn't hold your gold standard. Your, you had to devalue vis-a-vis -vis gold. And the beauty of the system of the 19th century is that countries did not devalue. They had to adjust their economic policy in order to keep the valuation stable of their currency. Now, this system has disappeared with the First World War, and it will not be recreated. But the essence of what has disappeared is this. There is no discipline, no principles in the way the system functions internationally. If you had had, in 1971, when President Nixon abandoned the Bretton Woods system, if you had had a true floating currency system, it would have been different because the big deficit countries would have had to devalue. That's the essence of, of, a, of a floating system. When you are weak, your currency gets weak, and is devalued. But it didn't work that way. The countries massaged their currency. The United States was in big deficit and wanted to be in big deficit because that was our choice. And she didn't devalue. What did she do? She borrowed currencies. And in order to strengthen the dollar and to avoid a disastrous fall in the dollar. So each country managed its currency in its own way, essentially with export-led ambitions. 
So that's what happened. And what disappeared in that system was an element of discipline. Everybody did what they wanted. And I think that the ease of borrowing that we have seen over the last 40 years has a lot to do with the destruction of the Bretton Woods system. So I call for the restoration of some element of discipline. Bernard Stumar shares that view. I think it is essential. You have been right to put your question on that because it is the, in my view, the essence of the derailing of the system that I have described in my book. Thank you. Mr. Gramenia, I have a question for you. Uh, you have been a Minister of Foreign Affairs, you've been a Minister of uh, Finance. Ultimately, uh, what is perhaps most lacking, or what has been lacking in the past, is perhaps political union, or uh, let's say circumstances that would make it politically uh, possible to advance uh, faster uh, than we have seen. Um, I think Jean Monnet has always said that Europe will be created through, through crisis. Now, today, uh, or let's say with the um, combination, simultaneously, of so many crises, the Ukraine crisis, the, the climate uh, crisis, the migration crisis, do you see perhaps now uh, a good window of opportunity um, for um, the European Union to make progress and to uh, complete or solve some of those um, still uh, to be done parts of the agenda of the European um, uh, Economic and Monetary Union? So <clears throat> let me uh, so first correct. I was not Minister of Foreign Affairs. I was di a diplomat. Sorry, sorry. Uh, no, no problem. Just not that I let that in the air, and then somebody said you did not deny that. You know, so, ah, it's, it's, I'm just joking. It's, it's okay. <laughs> it's not no problem at all. Um, you know, I have the tendency to 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 be a, an optimist. And uh, let me answer your question in the following manner. If you had asked me uh, in 1995, no, no, 2015, sorry, so eight years ago, in the middle of the Greek crisis, where we had a risk that the monetary union and the, the euro area would fall apart, where the ESM was new, where some were advocating that Greece should leave. In fact, the Greeks are smart because they themselves did not want to leave. But it's the other countries who say, I mean, if you do not play by the rules, then you have to go out. If you had asked me at that time, do you think it would ever be possible that the EU would go on the markets, in this case the Commission, borrowing money to redistribute it to the countries on the basis of their vulnerabilities. I say, you're a complete dreamer. I mean, that's not, not at all where we are. You're in the wrong movie. We, we are fighting for the survival of the euro area, and you're asking me if Europe would go out on the markets to borrow money to, to redistribute to others, and half that money is subsidies, it's not loans. The ESM uh, provides loans that you have to pay back, not subsidies. So we have done progress in terms of solidarity. I think that, I, that is enormous. Now, in the field of finance, in the field of support uh, of weaker countries, on top of what was done before. Look, the role the Commission plays today, the role Mrs. van der Leyen has worldwide, how much this is recognized today in the world. If you would have asked me again 10 or 15 years ago, I would not have believed it. So one thing is what the treaties say. 
The second thing is what you make out of it and how you can convince the ministers in the different formations, be it the foreign affairs, the finance ministers and all the others and the prime ministers in the European Council, how you can convince them to use the framework that is available to solve problems. And I understand pretty well where Jacques de la Rosière comes from and the question that was asked by Armand Kless, and which is also the book of uh, Mr. Triffin. In terms of financial standards, financial logics, the world in which we live, defies all these rules. Even the word quantitative easing is an invention of the last 15 years. A central bank buying, purchasing bonds from countries and putting them on the bank account of the central bank was never done, certainly minimally done. So we live a period of financial innovation that bears risks, but also brings benefits. So my answer is definitely political union, more cohesion in Europe, more unity in Europe, Europe goes hand in hand with these innovations that we have seen in finance and in, in other fields. So you might say that I am a, a total optimist, but what I'm telling you is what we have witnessed the last 15 years in this world of permanent crisis. And last but not least, which comes to my mind now, we have now two major currencies in the world, mainly obviously the dollar. The euro is 20 to 25 percent uh, of international reserves. And then you have Japanese yen, the pound, you have the Chinese one. We are going towards a multipolar uh, world with a few currencies. Let's be happy that we have one. And let's be happy to and be pleased that it is one that covers, well, the whole euro area. Not completely the whole Euro uh, European Union yet, but 20 countries out of 27. So I'm definitely positive. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that we have now to uh, conclude this uh, very fascinating um, uh, afternoon and try to, uh, to summarize the key messages that we have heard. And we, we started with uh, Robert Triffin, and you will excuse me as I'm chairman of the Robert Triffin International Association to, to insist on the, the essential contributions he made both to the debate on the reform of the international monetary system and also on the architecture, the, the building of the European Economic and, um, and, and Monetary uh, Union. Um, he, was, he had this lucidity uh, to see uh, what is called the Triffin Dilemma, which is the the difficulties in which the system falls when the currency of one particular country is used as the international uh, currency. But at the same time, he, he perceived the, the political uh, difficulty of putting his, his ideas in, in practice. He had some very partial successes with the creation at uh, the Rio uh, conference of the special drawing right, but as only a complementary um, uh, uh, instrument for uh, reserve um, um, uh, accumulation. When he, he, he met something that he, on which no progress in the short term was possible, he moved to the other subject, which was regional economic and monetary integration, and he made uh, very uh, fundamental contributions, uh, particularly uh, to the um, exchange rate uh, the mechanism of the European uh, system, um, the monetary, monetary um, uh, system. Uh, so pragmatism is really, at the end of the day, wh what is needed. A clear view of long-term objectives, but in the face of uh, obstacles, trying to find out where um, uh, concrete progress can be made. Now, the key subject 
today was sustainability. Uh, is the European Economic and Monetary Union a myth or a, a reality? I think this is a very serious issue. Um, and uh, all the, um, the comments that were made by Jacques de la Rosière, the very critical uh, observations of the imbalances, uh, of um, particularly these uh, fundamental uh, imbalance uh, between monetary integration and the uh, lack of um, economic uh, integration has to be taken very, very seriously. Uh, at the same time, this should give us a strong motivation to see what can be done on each of the observations made. But here comes the, the comment that was made by Mr. Gramenia, the counterfactual. Uh, would uh, the common market, the single market, be sustainable if we had not moved towards economic and monetary uh, integration? Here, I think, Mr. Gramenia, you, you are really the, the successor of Pierre Werner, in uh, seeing so clearly the articulation of the different steps of the European integration um, 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 project. And uh, you explained to us very clearly how step by step a number of loopholes uh, have, been, have been closed. And each time we have needed a, a, a crisis, particularly the great financial crisis out of which uh, came on one side uh, the Jacques de la Rosière report with a number of um, um, recommendations on uh, stronger uh, regulations, which have been, I think, to a large extent followed in the introduction of the macro prudential policies. But on the other side, of course, the European stability mechanism, the, the safety net that should have been there from the, uh, from the, from the beginning. Uh, at the same time, the decision was, oh, no, not, I mean, two years later, the decision was taken to move toward the European Banking Union and their significant progress, even if the, has, has been achieved, even the agenda is not completed. Uh, we have the project of the European Capital Markets Union. I think you are right to have uh, stressed the, the need for securitization. Um, we are not very advanced, but we are, we are nevertheless um, uh, moving. Then came the, the COVID crisis, which um, prompted the, um, the European Commission to propose uh, this uh, new generation AU, AU fund. And this is, of course, a, a, a kind of a systemic uh, progress towards creation of some sort of a fiscal capacity at, um, at, at the AU level. And again, um, in the Ukraine crisis and the um, combination of all the crises that we see uh, currently, uh, you, uh, you, the European institutions are proactive and some progress, perhaps insufficient, but nevertheless significant progress is being done. So this leads us to the notion, I think, of journey. I mean, there is a journey and there are, are long-term uh, uh, objectives. And to move further, perhaps uh, we need uh, the, the indignation of what I would uh, call the, the moral indignation of Robert uh, Triffin, who was uh, indignant uh, at uh, the inequity, in his right, of the international monetary system. At the same time, I would call you perhaps, um, Mr. La Rosière, a little bit, you are pessimist in your intelligence. But at the same time, perhaps you are also, like Mr. Gramenia, an optimist of the will. And that's the combination that is necessary uh, to make progress in um, European integration. Uh, Altesse Royale, um, Excellence, Mesdames, Messieurs, je vous remercie beaucoup de, de ma, que j'ai pu être invité ici uh, comme modérateur. Je pense que nous devons tous remercier. We have to uh, to thank uh, all the, the speakers of this very interesting afternoon. Thank you very much.
The public is kindly invited to the cocktail, uh, which will be uh, organized in the cloister of uh, the Abbey de Neumünster.